Revered by Bible scholars and taught in theological seminaries worldwide, the first book of Enoch is one of the most fascinating extra-biblical books in history. What is the book of Enoch? Today's guest will explain right now. Welcome everybody to the Skywatch Television Studios. It's so good to have all of you. What an incredible show today, Tom, that we have planned. I'm Joe Artis Horn, and I'm joined in the studio today by the Skywatch investigative team, and we have an incredibly packed program for you. But before we dive into that, let me introduce today's special guest. He's a PhD in Hebrew Bible and Semitic languages and holds a master's degree in ancient history and Hebrew studies. Best-selling author, Dr. Michael Heiser. So for those of you joining us in the studio and from home, we're framing the next few weeks, Tom, in this incredible discussion around what is the book of Enoch and why do so many Bible scholars refer to this work when they're teaching at you know, theological seminaries and various uh, colleges and places of academia across the states and across the world, and why is this such a hot discussion? And where do Bible scholars disagree at certain junctures? And I can't think of a better guest to have in-house than Mike Heiser today. Right. Mm -hmm. So Mike, I wanna, before we get into the Book of Enoch, let's just premise the conversation a little bit. People sure. that have not seen programs at Skywatch with, with you in the past, uh, maybe they've not followed your work. Why don't you introduce yourself a little bit and, and just tell us, you're involved in ministry at college and you've got some new endeavors happening there. Mm -hmm. Just for the people joining us, give them a little bit of back history on you and, sure. and what got you started in ministry. Yeah. Um, I, before moving to Florida a year ago, I spent 14 years at Logos Bible Software. So I was a couple of titles, academic editor, scholar in residence, but those translate into language geek. Okay. That's pretty much what that is. <laughs> Um, we did ancient language databases, and I wrote a lot of reference content. Uh, I was one of the three people that pioneered something called mobile education, uh, which was a lot of co coursework on video. You know, we, they had classes, 150 different scholars across the nation, across the world, really. Mm -hmm. So it was a great academic job that didn't involve grading any papers. <laughs> I got to meet scholars from all over the world and, you know, just interact with them, spend some you know, off time with them. Mm -hmm. But before that, I taught uh, on the green campus at a couple of schools, uh, Christian schools, liberal arts schools, a little bit at the University of uh, Wisconsin, which is where I uh, finished my PhD in 2004. Before that, you know, I went to a couple of different grad schools and seminaries. So I, I've taught probably online and green campus 20 years and have done a lot of other different kinds of academic work, but now, uh, I'm in Florida, and I'm head of the School of uh, Theology, the Awakening School of Theology is what we call it. It's a brand new school, and basically it's a non-credit uh, program where I spend the first year going through the content of Unseen Realm, which is sort of the book I'm known for. It's uh, a great book, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we spend 30 weeks going through Unseen Realm. It has sold probably close to 300,000 copies at this point, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it, it's had a lot of impact. Uh, so we wanted to do that. And then the second year, they just told me you can sort of do whatever you want. You know? So it's sure. a two-year program that we give a certificate. We're in our second year, and I'm focused on apologetics, you know, sort of the, the fringy things that people hear on you know, TV or Internet or sure. podcasts and whatnot that really, unfortunately, threaten a lot of people's faith. Mm -hmm. And so we want to sort of pick our way through that minefield Right. and try to help people just think better about those topics and about scripture. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Mike, and this is one of the things we actually love about you, is that you're a true PhD, but you're willing to kind of <laughs> venture out into oh, yeah. some of this, you know, edgy type stuff. Well, that's kind of who we are too, yeah, right? right? We it's, <laughs> it's our hook. It gives us an opportunity to talk about deeper things, scripture and so on. But I actually recall uh, maybe it was three years ago now, and you were sitting in our home, uh, and you said, I, I got contacted by this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a, a, a mega pastor or something, right? And at that time, it was just a conversation. And now here, these, you know, these three years later, and there you are, and you're building this school. Yeah, and if, if you've ever wondered what would happen to one of these churches that, you know, the outsiders like me, we use terms like mega church, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, what would happen if all of a sudden the leadership kind of woke up and, and realized that, you know, we're really not doing the kind of things mm. we're supposed to be doing. We've become entertainment oriented rather yeah. than content oriented. Well, I get mm. to live that now. 
Hmm. It, it's, it's a huge ship, and, it, and you know it takes a lot of effort to turn the ship, but they are serious about producing content, which is why they wanted me to come. Yeah. Excellent story, though. I, I still remember that at the time. Yeah. It's like, I'm yeah, not I didn't sure know what what's happening. Yeah, I didn't know what to <laughs> think. I actually heard the uh, uh, not too long ago that your college is actually working together with Redemption Ministries now yeah. so that any student, any student, whether they have a bachelor's degree or anything else, can work together with Redemption Ministry and Awakening mm -hmm. Theology School mm -hmm. and start working on their master's in Bible and theology. Yeah, when my last couple of years at Lagos, there was another guy in the building, John Schwant, who started Redemption Seminary. And the idea was to sort of leverage the software content and also the mobile ed content into a degree program. And because of their relationships with schools outside you know, of the company, they have had schools that approve their credits. And because of my relationship with Logos, we've worked out an arrangement where you can, even if you don't have a bachelor's degree, mm -hmm. you can get into my school, go through that, and then you essentially move into the next one. And because of their relationships, at the end of the road, they will validate your credits and you'll have a master's degree, even if you don't have a bachelor's degree, which wow. sounds kind of crazy. Cool. Mm -hmm. But, the, you know, it's state approved. It's accredited. So there is a path for people like that. And there are a lot of them. Yeah. Well, Mike, let's let's shift gears because we do have limited time, mm -hmm. and I want to make sure we pack this with a whole bunch of information for viewers that are not familiar with the Book of Enoch, maybe people that are that want to expand their knowledge of the book. But before I do that, I want to just mention we are in part discussing some of Mike's uh, more recent works. You've done two companion study books mm -hmm. on the Book of Enoch. It's a two-volume set, and we're going to tell you in just a few minutes uh, how you can get copies of those along with a DVD where he's teaching and also the original book of Enoch in hardbound. So it's a really cool collection. It's basically everything you need to dive right into the discussion. But what is the book of Enoch? How old is it? And why do so many people talk about it mm -hmm. if it's an extra biblical book? Yeah, it's important for a lot of reasons. It, it is, you know, in technical terms, it's what we would call an apocalypse. So it's sort of a grand vision of the end of days, the day of the Lord, but it gives sort of the reason why the world is in the chaotic mess that it's, that it's in. So it goes all the way back to the early chapters of Genesis, specifically mm -hmm. Genesis 6, and then sort of moves sure. forward. You know, why did the world become so corrupt? You know, why, why are we in this mess? And so now when you get into, into Enoch, it's, it's sort of the vision of the end of days, the Messiah is about to come and set everything right. Uh, for, for biblical students, if you think of the day of the Lord concept, which we as Christians would think of the second coming, okay? If you think of it that way, it's a time when the Messiah is going to show up. He's going to vindicate the righteous and the wicked are going to get punished. Not only the wicked who have rejected the Messiah, but also the supernatural forces that are in charge of them. So that's essentially in a nutshell, what Enoch is, a series of visions and parables and stories and whatnot mm -hmm. that sort of have that angle. Uh, Date-wise, the earliest material we have for Enoch is anywhere from the 3rd to 2nd century BC. And that is kind of why it's important, because there are things in the book that sound very Christian. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, so much so that a number of scholars have wondered if parts of the book wasn't, they, they weren't written by Christians. Right. And most of the, the scholarly community acknowledges, no, this, this isn't a Christian author for any portion of it. <laughs> it's just that these threads of theology are found in early Judaism. And when you get into the New Testament period, it's like, you know, boom, they're all of a sudden they're developed, but then the focal point is Jesus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it, it's really important for that reason and, and others as well. You know, Mike, um, it, it was actually revolutionary to me, uh, your first book, and then we got to publish the... the Reversing Hermon. Yeah, Reversing yeah. Hermon, which is kind of unseen realm light. Um, <laughs> but, it, but it is, both of those works to me are revolutionary in the sense that I came out of it believing that you cannot fully understand a great mm -hmm. deal of Scripture, mm -hmm. especially in the life of Christ, mm -hmm. places where he goes, things that he does, things that he's saying, unless you understand how the book of Enoch had kind of molded the worldview of the Hebrews at his time and in what they were looking for. Yeah. And I, you know, I pastored 25 years, and so I talk about God delivering us from the fall. And I'm, this is dating back to the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden, but... Yeah. But then through your works, we realize 
the role that the book of Enoch played, but also the Messiah is coming to redeem them from the curse that mm-hmm. was brought on the world by the watchers, right? Yeah. You know, I, I always introduce the subject this way. If you ask the average Christian, why is the world in such a mess? The answer you get is the fall, you know, Genesis mm-hmm. 3. Mm-hmm. But if you ask the same question to, again, a Jew living third, second century BC, even the first century, you know, when the apostolic age, when Jesus was here in his incarnation, that is not the answer you'd get. They would say, well, there's actually three reasons why the world is such a mess. You have the fall, that's where it starts. And then the Genesis 6 episode was of central importance to their theology. And we sort of as Christians historically have been taught to not see anything supernatural there. And so we never get it. You never get exposed to it. And then the third is what happens at Babel. And, and that's off the radar too, you know, for, for Christian thinking. So mm-hmm. Unseen Realm reversing Hermon really, you know, helps raise this issue uh, and a lot of issues to be honest. But if you have this in your head, as a Jew living in Jesus' day, that there are three reasons why the world is a mess. You expect the Messiah to fix all three, <laughs> not just the death sure. problem, not just sense. the, we, we need to overcome the death with the fall. There, there's, there, there should be things in the New Testament that directly address the other two, and there are. Mm-hmm. There's a lot is of Is that it. why you think the book of Enoch gets so much attention? I, I do. The, the early church, you know, again, the first couple centuries of, of the early church, they were still familiar with this kind of discussion. Just this last week, I got an email from somebody who was essentially taking heat in their church for, okay. for teaching some of the content of my book. <laughs> and they're like, this person says, the, old, you know, the early church fathers, they didn't look at it this way. They didn't, they didn't dip into any of this you know, Enoch stuff. And so I sent him an article just on you know, the problem of evil. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Irenaeus, who was a very well-known church father. And he's all over Enoch. So I think that is why, you know, we, it gets this attraction. The early church fathers bring it up. Mm-hmm. They, have, they have a different worldview in mm-hmm. terms of what the Messiah was supposed to have done. It, it's much more expansive, but we're kind of cut off from it. And Enoch has become kind of an entry point for a lot of people because the church fathers were so aware of it. Well, it's quoted in the New Testament. Yeah. Um, yeah. In but in addition to that, I know you've said that there's a lot of the ideas that are incorporated in the New mm-hmm. Testament are actually derived from the book of Enoch. Yeah, yeah. And there's, in reversing Hermon, there's a whole appendix of what you might call New Testament allusions to Second Temple Jewish literature. Second Temple period is the intertestamental period, roughly 500 BC into the first century. And so it's, it isn't just Enoch, although Enoch has prominence, but there are a lot of allusions in the content to ideas that are found in these books, Book of Life. Okay, I mean, Book of Life and Revelation, you know, five or six times. Well, where did we run into that earlier? You know, the mm-hmm. Book of Enoch. You know, again, it's not the only source, but it, Enoch talks about this stuff. And so there are just a number of theological uh, points that New Testament writers were tracking along books like Enoch with that we're, again, we're just sort of oblivious to the connection points. How would these two companion volumes really help the reader understand more about the book of Enoch and its significance? When people th- hear the word commentary, mm-hmm. they typically think of, well, this is, this is gonna be a verse by verse, line by line, mm-hmm. you know, word by word. It, it, it's gonna feel real tedious. And this is not actually what that is. What I try to do is if, if you were reading the book of Enoch and I was sitting next to you, mm-hmm. I would be pointing out things of interest Mm. in the book with an eye toward picking out things that have some relationship to your Old or New Testament. Mm -hmm. And so I'm sort of the guide by the side. Hey, look at this phrase here. You know, you know, this is what they would have been thinking when they, Mm. you know, saw that phrase. Mm -hmm. And this is how it spills over you know, into things that you're more familiar with, like, mm-hmm. you know, Christianity, New Testament, Old Testament, that sort of thing. So that's one of the goals of, of the reader's commentary. So to so sort of help you unravel what it is you're reading. And a, and a question that I know is going to be on a lot of people's head just before mm-hmm. we go to the break is that if the book of Enoch is so important, if even some of the early church fathers advocated for it mm-hmm. to be considered part of scripture, why isn't it in the canon? Why isn't it yes, in the Bible? Yes, we'll deal yeah, with that when that we come was, back. Okay. That's, a great, that's a great leading question heading into the break. <laughs> Folks, we'll be right back. We want to make sure that you know how to get a copy of the original book of Enoch along with both volumes of the support study guides by Dr. Michael Heiser right now. 
Call now and get the companion to the Book of Enoch special collection featuring the original Book of Enoch in beautifully bound hardback edition and both of Dr. Michael Heiser's groundbreaking companion guides to the Book of Enoch along with the shocking expose, Fallen Angels and Ancient Aliens on DVD. This is an exclusive offer for our Skywatch television audience. Yours for a donation of $35 plus shipping and handling. Volumes 1 and 2 of the companion guides to Enoch unveil what most of the modern church has never heard regarding how the sin of the watchers in Enoch 6 through 16 helped frame the mission of Jesus, how the descriptions of the Antichrist, the Messiah, the end times day of the Lord, and the final judgment connect to Genesis 6 and the Nephilim. This and so much more. Plus, you will also receive on DVD, The Book of Enoch, Fallen Angels and Ancient Aliens, an exclusive production with Dr. Michael Heiser regarding the blatant lies of ancient astronaut theory and the horrifying nature of fallen angels and alien abduction. This DVD is a must have, but that's not all. You'll also receive the beautifully printed hardback edition of the original historical Book of Enoch from Defender Publishing. Perfect for assisting serious researchers and students in the study of the Bible and the early age. Sold separately, these items hold a retail value of $90. Yours now for your donation of only $35 plus shipping and handling while supplies last. Whether you've read the Book of Enoch or want to journey through it for the first time, without a doubt, you'll find the companion to the Book of Enoch special collection absolutely essential. Order now at skywatchtvstore.com or call 1-844-750-4985. Welcome back to Skywatch TV. We're having a fascinating discussion with Dr. Michael Heiser about the Book of Enoch, what it is, and of course his two uh, study guides that go along with the book and the offer that you just saw. Um, and right before the break, Tom asked a question. Mike, why with so much attention around the Book of Enoch from theologians, Bible scholars, so many people in academia suggesting it's almost required reading, and then you have this other side of the, the building in, in Christianity and religion that say, Anything that's extra biblical may be in question, may not have any validity, it may not hold water, probably shouldn't be reading it. Uh, you know, what, what is your opinion about why the book of Enoch didn't make it into the Bible? Mm -hmm. Well, before I, I get into that, I should say a book does not have to be canonical to be useful. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. The New Testament writers quote from all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. okay. You know, Paul mm -hmm. quotes from Greek poets to make right. points, okay? Uh, Old Testament quotes from the Baal cycle, you know? I mean, it, it, they do these things for a reason to connect with their audience and make, make points. Now, as far as Enoch goes, it, it's a bit of a tricky question because in the Jewish community, Enoch was not considered canonical except by one sect, the people that we know from Qumran, where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. And the, the typical reason why it was rejected was the Jews had a sense of, you know, going back into the biblical period, that we're not going to embrace a book as sacred or canonical unless we can find it witnessed in Hebrew. Seems like a very simple litmus test that the reformers actually go back to this, uh, th this idea. And as far as we know, the, the book of Enoch was not composed in Hebrew. The stuff of the Dead Sea Scrolls is in Aramaic. Okay. That really didn't stop, though, the people at Qumran from considering it sacred. And we know that they elevated the book of Enoch in particular in their canon because of the way they cite it. Hmm. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll quote Enoch like they do quote scripture. Right. Okay? Gotcha. And the, the, other, the other thing they do is they also wrote a commentary. There's, there's evidence for commentaries on Enoch in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the only other ones that you have are commentaries on sacred books. Mm -hmm. So the fact that mm -hmm. you get commentaries on the biblical books and then there's this one outlier, <laughs> it sort of tells you that, you know, how they looked at it. Otherwise they wouldn't have yeah. invested the time. Uh, you know, I heard that there was a pressure between the between when the New Testament was canonized in like 397 or something like that and the, and the first council for the Old Testament between those two periods that there was a, uh, a number of heretics that rose up and had like their own kind of version of what could be considered the canonized Bible. And it forced the church into a position yeah. to draw a line in the sand and say, these are, these are not based on what 
generations upon generations of uh, Bible readers had considered to be holy and, mm -hmm. and inspired, and that it was the it was kind of the it was a pragmatic the choice. Yeah, I mean, what you're describing, uh, if if your listeners want a book on this, and it's an academic book, but it's called Constantine's Bible. And it, it, it's a myth that Constantine decided what was going to be in the New Testament, right. or of course the Old, but, but it gets its title from the fact that at Nicaea, Constantine wanted a decision made because just as you described, we've got the Christian community scattered all over the ancient world and, and nobody can quite agree on what we should consider sacred writings mm -hmm. post Old Testament. And so he said, look, fellas, I mean, he literally says, I want 50 copies of you know, the Christian Bible on my desk, you know, by X date. And then he leaves and says, you know, sayonara, we'll see you later, you know, get that done. <laughs> and they, they sort of looked around the room and oh, now we're in trouble. Because like now we have to actually make a decision. And so what they do, I think was, was kind of smart. It's pragmatic. They said, okay, let's take a look at some of those lists that are circulating of canonical books. Mm -hmm. And let's get the list of all the books that nobody fights over. <laughs> Got it? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> like here, scribes start copying. Uh, so they, they picked a minimalist canon. But we know from the church fathers, you know, mm -hmm. ongoing that there was this discussion about Enoch in particular and, and a handful of other things mm -hmm. uh, that some really felt, you know, should be in there. But at the end of the day, pe Christians were willing to assume that the Holy Spirit had moved within mm. the family of God, you know, the, the church, <laughs> and we're going to go, you know, with, you know, the, the majority here, the, the overwhelming majority, under the assumption that the Spirit has guided us providentially to recognize the New Testament. And that's how we got our New Testament books and why Enoch was left outside. But Enoch was still something that was referenced and studied for quite a while. Yeah, James was argumented as not being yeah. included, Hebrews. Yep. Hebrews yeah. Yeah. So they went through a process. And, we, and I'm, I, you know, I would actually even agree with the idea that we accept that God in his providence mm -hmm. provided the Bible that we have today. Sure. For the longest time, the Apocrypha, they would be published in the back of some versions mm -hmm. of the right. Bible. Right. Right. And some still do that today, but not as much. Yeah, I mean, you... That, that's actually, again, a, the product of either a historical accident or, again, how, however you want to view Providence's role here. But when somebody actually came up with the idea to invent the book, I mean, somebody actually had to do that. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, you see the scrolls all the time. Mm -hmm. Well, somebody had to, had to look at that and say, you know, this is really inconvenient. You know, like, <laughs> I, I want to see something in the middle. I don't want to keep unwinding this thing. And then I, <laughs> right. So what, what they did was they decided to cut leaves you know, cut the scroll into leaves and then stack them and then sew one side together. Okay. And it also allowed them then to write on both sides of a sheet. A codex. Right. Because, yeah, you, you can't just go to, to Office Max and, you know, uh -huh. some, you know, get some paper there. Well, we can, but, yeah, you know. We can. Yeah. <laughs> but, but it was very pragmatic. That leads me to another interesting question. Let me see if I can frame this properly. So you've written two volumes now that support the Book of Enoch, help new students and stuff sort, mm -hmm. sort of navigate. The first one is the book of the Watchers. And then in the second volume, you have the parables mm -hmm. of Enoch. Mm -hmm. So on its face, it almost seems like the book of Enoch is actually several books. Yeah. Is that the case? Yeah, it, it actually is. The, the book of Enoch can be and has been divided into, you know, half a dozen mm -hmm. books. The book of the Watchers is 36 chapters, chapters 1 through 36. And then the book of the parables is chapters 37 through 71. And then they get sort of smaller as you, as you go to the final 108th uh, chapter. So it is actually a composite work, but the content of all of it is sufficiently Enochian. <laughs> In other words, it, it loops back into the first 36 chapters, which are crucial, the book of the watchers. Mm -hmm. That's sort of viewed by scholars as like, this is like the guts of the Book of Enoch. And so since the rest of the content sort of repurposes that and references it, that's how sort of these other things were accrued to the book. And mm -hmm. it's also manuscript preservation. You know, you get mm -hmm. manuscripts that don't just, you know, that are wider than the first 36 chapters, but there are divisions. And maybe the point should also be made, uh, Mike, for the, maybe the person out there that's largely uninformed, they're going to go on the internet, oh wait, there's several books of Enoch, oh, there's book right. two, book yeah, three, right. uh, what would you say yeah. about that? What we refer to here is the book of Enoch, and in uh, my commentaries, that is what's 
what is called in scholarly parlance, First Enoch. It's 108 chapters. Mm -hmm. okay. Second okay. Enoch is a different work that is a couple hundred years later, and it's mm -hmm. actually written in Slavonic. Wow. It's not in Aramaic or Greek or anything like that. And Third Enoch is a Hebrew book, and that's still later than the other two. Mm -hmm. So... When you, if you're thinking Book of Enoch, the one you want is First Enoch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the other two are largely considered to just be fraudulent documents created. Yeah, they, maybe. there was there was never any discussion, you know, in the early Christian community about the other two. Right, mm -hmm. and of course that is hardbound in this special offer that we're mm -hmm. making available that you just watched a few moments ago. So there was a lot of Tom. There was a lot of consideration when deciding. You know, Defender's going to republish the, the original Book of Enoch. Mm -hmm. We've got to make sure that we don't get a and obviously a scam or a public domain version that somebody's added to or changed yeah. or edited or snipped. Well, um, and we've even had that question when people have called, you know, to mm -hmm. the customer service, hey, which book right. of Enoch is this? Which version is it? So I'm well, that and, has and again, come up. And again, for me, the importance of the book of Enoch is not to try to equate it to the canon of Scripture to say that it ought to be in the Bible or anything like that. It's how much it molded the worldview of the Jews at the right. time of Christ. And that's the part that for me is interesting because mm -hmm. then it can help you understand parts of Scripture, parts of the life of Christ, why he was doing what he was doing. You know, right. I, I still get questions, you know, why, why should we read this other material? Why should we read pagan material to understand the Bible. Well, whether you like to think of it this way or not, you, every one of us, has been influenced by our own environment, that the church we were raised in, the denominational context, you know, our relationships with other Christians, just our wider culture. So we are influenced to read even things like the Bible a certain way. We're just influenced by all those things just in all areas of life. Well, the biblical writers weren't Martians, okay? <laughs> you know, they, they were human beings and they're influenced by their culture and what they read and, and, and their, their believing community. And part of that matrix was certainly the book of Enoch. And so the idea that, you know, hey, maybe we should read Enoch and some of this other stuff so that we would become more intelligent readers of what the New Testament writers actually produced mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. makes complete sense. Yep. They're no different mm -hmm. than we are. They operate under inspiration. You know, they're, they're led by the Spirit, you know, to look or remember this or that, you know, and, and the Spirit's only going to use what's in their head, okay? So if they're reading this material, they're used to it. If it's useful to help them express an important idea, you better believe they're going to do it because they're trying to connect with their audience and it makes sense. Well, again, the fact that Jesus obviously went out of his way mm -hmm. to show himself as the antithesis of much of what was written yeah. in the book of Enoch tells me that, that, that this that, is important. That's because... actually a big deal in the, in the second volume here with the parables because there's, this, the parables are known for Messiah talk mm -hmm. in Enoch, but that mm -hmm. isn't quite what you get in the New Testament. They're... There are important overlaps, but there are some really important differences. And we're going to talk about those next week in uh, program we, number two. We are. We're going to continue building this series, and <laughs> next week we are going to talk about the parables of Enoch. Mike Kaiser will return to discuss <laughs> the Good. parables of Enoch. So you guys, <laughs> are you learning stuff? Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, we're out of time. I'm Joe Horn. For everybody on panel, thank you so much for joining <laughs> us. We'll be back next week. Keep your eyes on the prize, which is Jesus Christ. See you next time. Thank you for watching. Keep up with all of Skywatch TV's programs by subscribing to our channel at YouTube and following us on Facebook and Twitter.